the 23rd of February. The maiden is summoned to see the king. We travel the circular road from the inn up to the bridge leading through the main gate. There are three forts behind the fortress walls. On one end, the towers of the Fort du Coudray. On the other end, the Fort Saint-Georges. In the middle is the Chateau du Milieu, where the Dauphin resides. The maiden is to be received in the great hall there. As we ride into the courtyard, a coarse-looking man staggers towards us, reeking of alcohol. He sees Jeanne and makes vile and vulgar suggestions to the girl. She is not offended, but says to him sadly, Sir, why do you use your time to offend God when you are so near to death? What? What do you mean? Uh, clear the way, you fool, or the king will hear of it. What does she mean? Oh, yeah, come back! Come back, wait! What? What is... What is... Who was... We are led to the Great Hall, whereupon we are met by the Dauphin's Grand Chamberlain. Good maiden, I am Georges de la Tremoille. I have been given the honor of escorting you to His Highness. Merci, monsieur. His Highness is at the far end of the Great Hall, seated on the throne. Do not be shy, though there are quite a few members of the royal court inside. Open the doors! The Great Hall is a giant rectangle, stretching to a massive fireplace and ornate throne. The walls are covered by hundreds of lit torches. Hundreds of people are gathered, dressed in the colorful clothes of the nobility, the clergy, the high-ranking soldiers. They had been chatting amiably and loudly, but now fall silent as the peasant girl passes through. My Lord Chamberlain, everyone looks so festive. Have I interrupted a party? They are here to see you, dear girl. Oh? The Dauphin is on the throne, you say? Yes, Brussel. Directly ahead. There must be a mistake. Why do you stop? He is waiting. Are you playing games with me, my Lord Chamberlain? Games, child, I assure you. Sir, the one on the throne is not the Dauphin. That is absurd. Of course it is. No. He... He is... There. Why does he stand in the back of the crowd? Dear girl, I promise you. P pardon. Please. You, you could just allow me through. Maiden, please. You, sir. You do not dress as the king. But... Yes. I am your servant. Your Highness. What are you doing? Why, do not bow to me. The king is there, on the throne. In God's name, my gentle Dauphin, tis you and none other who stands before me. May God give you a long life. Well. <laughs> yes. Well done, child. You have caught me out. I am your gentle Dauphin. I am indeed sorry for the prank, but it seemed a pleasant way to test you. Now rise. Tell me, why have you come to me? The King of Heaven sends me to you with this message. You shall be anointed and crowned in the city of Vance as the King of France, the Lieutenant of the King of Heaven. Quiet! Bold words, sweet maiden, but you must give me cause to believe you, as I wish to do with my whole heart. Sire, if I tell you things so secret that you and God alone know them, will you believe that he has sent me? I will. May we go somewhere private to speak? Yes, of course. We are alone, good maiden. What then is the secret? I have so few, with spies watching me at every turn. Remember, sire, last All Saints' Day. You were alone in your oratory in the chapel of the castle at Loche. Yes, I remember it well. You asked three things of God. Yes. 
Have you spoken of these things to a confessor or to anyone who might have betrayed them to me? No, God alone heard me. Then hear me, gentle Dorfa. Your first request of God was that he should remove you from the throne if you are not France's true heir. You do not desire to be the cause of prolonging a war that brings so much suffering. I, this is so. The second was that you alone should be punished if your sins have caused the many troubles the people of France are forced to endure. You said that you are willing to die if God requires it. Is, is as you say. The third request was that the people should be forgiven and God's anger appeased if their own sins are the cause of their misery. You, you have spoken the truth as God alone knows it. Will you hear now what God has sent me to tell you? I will. Yes. God be praised. He has sent this young maiden to me. My Lord Chamberlain, I do not understand. Where are you taking me? Did the Dauphin not speak clearly? The apartments for our honoured guests are in the Tower of Coudre, at the far end of the castle. An apartment? But, sir, we have little time for apartments. We must raise the royal army and depart at once. In time, dear girl. A matter such as this is not simply accomplished by the snap of the Dauphin's fingers, or even God's. His Royal Highness must consult with his council. No doubt, they will want to speak with you as well. Meanwhile, you will have every comfort, and your own chapel in which to pray. My lord, this will not do. Please, take me back to the Dauphin. The Dauphin will see you again once we have finished. Finished what? Child, St. Paul instructs us to test and discern the spirits that come our way. Our king would be a fool to follow the vision of every peasant that claims to speak for God. But God has sent me with this message. You ask too much of those who have not seen nor heard what you have. Your message must be proven. And while it is proven, what becomes of the French blood being spilled by the English? <laughs> French blood has been spilled for a hundred years under the eyes of God. What is another day or month? To him. A castle is like a busy city. Messengers race in all directions. There are carpenters fixing wooden beams and masons chiseling on stone. Blacksmiths hammer on anvils while groomsmen brush their horses. Cooks chop at vegetables on wooden tables and stir the contents of large cauldrons with iron spoons. Chickens get under their feet, the occasional cat meows, dogs chase each other. Children scamper and play in corners, out of the way of scowling soldiers. Guards stand at attention or stroll with their spears held like walking sticks, their hands on the hilts of their swords. Cadets spar with one another using wooden swords or stand with their bows, shooting arrows at targets tied to bales of hay. The air is filled with the smell of damp straw, smoke, animals, and sweat. After mass, Jeanne is taken with two ladies of the court, Madame Treve and Madame Gaucourt. Madame Treve is the wife of Robert le Masson de Treve, the chancellor and one of the king's most trusted advisers. Madame Gaucourt is the wife of Raoul de Gaucourt, the capitaine of Chinon and once the bailiff of Orléans. I suspect this is the work of Yolande, the Dauphin's mother-in-law. She greatly desires the success of God's mission, but wisely knows that Jeanne must be proven. Madame Treve and Madame Gaucourt examine the girl. Then they assure the Dauphin that Jeanne truly is a virgin messenger. While this goes on, we learn that the soldier who had shouted vulgar words at Jeanne when she first arrived is now dead after falling into the river. You may recall that Jeanne had said he would die. The man should have taken her warning. But alas, some men are fools. 
I wonder what the king's council will prove to be. I was 13 years old. That was when you first heard a voice from God? Yes, my Lord Chamberlain. What did the voice tell you? The voice told me that I must leave my home in secret. Leave your home to go where? To Robert de Baudricourt, at the fortress of Vaucouleur, whereupon he would provide me with the means to reach the Dauphin. If I may, my Lord Chamberlain. Of course, my Lord Archbishop. How did you know the voice or the message was from God? Well, Saint Michael gave me assurance. Saint Michael? How did you know it was Saint Michael? By his voice. It was the voice of an angel. <laughs> you are skilled in the languages of the angels? No, my lord. Though I knew immediately who it was when I heard him speak. He told me that Saint Catherine and Saint Margaret would come to me with advice, and I should take action on what they said. My mission. Tell us again what mission you were given. To meet the Dauphin. That is all? I was told to raise the siege that has ravaged the city of Orléans, so the Dauphin may be crowned king at Reims. <laughs> you will end the siege? Gentlemen, order! Order! Girl, you were told by God that you would raise the siege. Are you skilled with the sword? With leading men in battle? No. And I said so to the voice. I said I was a poor girl who knew nothing of these things. But I was reminded of the unskilled peasant women our Lord has used for his purposes. You are thinking of our Holy Mother Mary? Yes. You dare to compare yourself to the Holy Mother? No, Archbishop. I only compare myself as a poor peasant girl to other peasants who have sought to serve God. Uh, that is enough for today. For today? But, sir, you must see the urgency. You are dismissed. Jeanne, the uh, food not your liking? Swan has been specially prepared. Uh, I am not hungry. Something wrong? These delays, Musha. Meetings, questions. Why do they fuss when God has made his will so clear? Does no one have the courage to take up this course? Well, royal officials are not known for courage, maiden. Caution is truer to their characters. Take heart. I have heard that someone has come who may be of help. Who? John II, the Duke of Alençon. It is said that he is with the Dauphin now. It is also said that he wishes to meet you. This is quite an honour for the Duke to give up his usual hunting trips to come to you. Do you mock me? I mock the Duke. But I have heard the Duke is a good man, a true son of France. Without question. He will serve you well, I am sure. Then please, Mouchard, take me to him. Perhaps he'll free me to march on Orléans. I will see what I can do. That's the only time I saw it, and that's the only time I think I'll ever see it again. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Next time. Next, Next time. time. <laughs> Next time. Your Highness, Jeanne of Don Remy. My angel. Bring her in. Mouchard has come as well. Oh. Well, yes, I suppose he may also enter. God grant you peace, my king. And you as well, Duke of Alençon. Pucelle. I am honoured to meet you. And you are most welcome. The more we gather together the royal blood of France, the better it will be for all. Ah, and who's that? Moucha! <laughs> My Lord Duke, a delight to see you again. Moucha, is there anyone in the kingdom you do not know? <laughs> well, how may I answer that, sire, if I do not know them? <laughs> Jeanne, please sit. I would have you know my friend the Duke better. Ah. <coughs> it is good that you have summoned me, Your Highness, as I have a message for you. Uh, what message? From whom does it come? God. Given to me today in the chapel. <clears throat> we will withdraw, sire. Yes. It is not necessary, Your Grace. Stay. Let all hear what I have been told. <clears throat> My gentle Dauphin, God has these words for you. 
Give your kingdom into the hands of the King of Heaven, and the King of Heaven will return it as a gift to you, as he has often done for your predecessors. You and all that should be yours will be restored. Ah. <clears throat> well, uh, merci. Right, uh, tomorrow, if the weather is fair, we shall go out to the meadow. Jean, you will show the Duke your skills in your armour, with sword play, even the lance. If it is what you desire, gentle Dauphin. See how she writes. Closing in. <laughs> Concentrate. Concentrate. And raise your lance. Fantastic. Raising it. Yes. yes. Good. Good. Yes. 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 Melvin. Yes. 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 Melvin. Yes. Ah. Yes. Bravo. Yes. Bravo, Jan. <laughs> Bravo. It is a wonder that a peasant girl can lance so well. She is graceful and skilled, but she must have a proper horse if she is to go into battle. Indeed. Will she go into battle, sir? I await my counsel's advice. She must have my horse. He is perfect for her. You would give her your beautiful black steed. You are generous, John. <gasps> sire, you must relieve her from these endless interrogations. Allow me to take her home to meet my wife. It will be restorative for her. <sighs> that would be a great favor to me, John. I know she is impatient, so, Yes. Take her home. Go quail hunting. <laughs> you are gracious, as always. We will leave tomorrow. And I will put pressure on my council. His Royal Highness wants a report about the peasant girl. What excuses can we give for our delay? Please speak, my Lord de Gokor. We must be wise. The girl comes from a frontier town, very near to our Burgundian enemies. They may have sent her to lure the king into a trap. But do any on the council truly believe she is a spy? The king will never believe such a thing. The girl is without guile, innocent even in her determination. Even so, we must be cautious. Keep the girl at a proper distance. Frankly, she is too close to the Dauphin. It is good she has gone with the Duke of Alençon. It gives us more time. Time? Have we not had enough time? Are you a believer, my Lord Chamberlain? If you were to give a report to His Highness now, what would you advise? <laughs> I am not a learned theologian, Archbishop. I may debate the prudence of the politics or the military strategy. But the Dauphin's first question is one of spiritual trust. A question of this importance is beyond us as a council. Is that what we will say? Forgive us, sire, but after days of debate, we have concluded that we, your council, cannot decide what to do. <laughs> the greatest theological minds of our nation are in Poitiers. As refugees from Paris. All the same, let them meet with the girl. Let them advise the Dauphin about what to do. Is that not their purpose? What else have they been doing since they were banished from Paris? Yes, I see your point, my Lord de Gaucourt. If they advise the king to heed the girl, and she fails to save Orléans, then the blame rests with them. If they advise him to dismiss the girl, then we are free of her. Yet the responsibility is theirs, right or wrong. Are we agreed? Mm. Agreed. Agreed. Right. I shall inform His Highness. Oh, Moussa. Some would say they are no better than Pontius Pilate, washing their hands of the matter rather than making a proper decision. They are cautious, my queen. I wonder if they have considered that God may finally be answering the prayers of his people, as he once did for the Hebrew slaves. What if this is the rescue they have long desired? You believe the Dauphin is Moses? He's more like Aaron. The members of the council think only of saving their own skins. 
They would rather cower under the rule of the English than disturb their comforts. So, Jeanne must go to Poitiers for questioning. May God grant her patience. Enter. My Lord de la Tremoille, it is late. Why have you summoned me? You will serve as the chair in Poitiers, my Lord Archbishop. Will I? Most certainly. Then you may guide the proceedings. Guide them? <laughs> you obviously do not understand how academics conduct such things. It is to our advantage that I say very little. I dare not expose any prejudice I might have. I see. You do understand how dangerous this girl is. Whatever happens in Poitiers, she must be controlled. My Lord Chamberlain, if she truly is a messenger from God, then are we not duty-bound to serve her? A messenger serves the king who is chosen by God to rule. So this peasant girl is here to serve us. Us? Don't you mean the king? We are the king, my Lord Archbishop. Do not forget it. The 2nd of March, 1429. The investigation of Jeanne the Maiden in Poitiers begins. Colleagues of this examination, let us begin. Thank you, my Lord Archbishop. Jeanne of Don Rémy. I am Jean Lombard, Professor of Theology at the University of Paris. Dear girl, are you anxious? No, Professor. St. Catherine came to comfort me last night. She reminded me that she had to defend the gospel against more than 50 pagan doctors. <laughs> St. Michael also appeared to me. He said I would be victorious in this trial and made worthy of our Lord Jesus Christ the hope and crown of those who strive for him. Now, what led you to come to our king? God has great pity on the people of France. He told me I must go into France. On hearing these words, I began to weep. Then the voices told me to go to Vaucouleur, where a captain would take me to the Dauphin. Pucelle, I am Brother Emery, Professor of Theology of the Order of Saint-Dominique. I must ask, the voice told you that God will deliver the people of France from their distress. But if God will deliver them, why does he need soldiers? The soldiers will fight, and God will give the victory. What kind of professor does not know that? Do you mock us, child? Well, perhaps only you, Brother Sugan. Ah, then you know who I am. You are the dean of this university. Then you understand that we are men who desire to discern the truth from you. Brother, the truth is that the King of Heaven has called me to raise the siege of Orléans and take the Dauphin to be crowned and anointed at Reims. The truth is as simple as that. We need proof. You want proof. You want a sign. But the proof and the sign will be God's victory at Orléans. How can I show you St. Michael, St. Catherine or St. Margaret unless they appear for themselves? They are not at my beck and call to summon as I wish. Dear girl, God would not have us place faith in your words without a miracle to prove that you are acting by his command. Without that, how may we advise the king to turn over an army to you and risk the lives of so many soldiers on your claims? In God's name, it was not to give a sign that I came to Poitiers, but take me to Orléans and I will show you the signs I have been sent to give. Give me soldiers, it does not matter how many, and I will go to Orléans. I submit to this council that Jeanne is the fulfillment of the age-old prophecy. A maiden will come to aid the King of France. 
Do we not have example after example in the scripture about the role of prophetic women throughout history? Well, I know nothing about women prophets cutting their hair short or wearing men's clothes. But the Old Testament is clear about women wearing men's garments. An abomination to God, it says. St. Paul himself wrote against cutting a woman's hair. We also acknowledge that many of those instructions were dispensations of the old law and not of the same nature as the commandments we follow. Few of us would deny that this girl is acting from pure motives out of modesty and not to defy God or the scriptures. The 22nd of March, the investigation of Jeanne the Maiden ends. I am Brother Sagan de Sagan, Professor of Theology and Dean of this esteemed University of Poitiers. I am designated as the spokesman for this learned council. <clears throat> it is the view of the council that the prayers of the poor people of France and all who sought peace and justice might well be answered now. Though Jeanne has not provided a miraculous sign, her life and testimony are enough for us to trust her in as much as we find no evil in her. We advise that our good king should not reject Jeanne. Instead, he should embrace that God has sent her to bring the people comfort. We believe the king should not hinder Jeanne from taking an army to Orléans, but trust God to do as he had told her he would. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. <clears throat> in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes, Monsieur Mouchard. You have heard the words of the council? I have, and I rejoice. Will the Dauphin see me now? No. You are to travel to the cities of Tours and Blois. Why would the Dauphin send me there? Because that is where you will find the commanders, troops and supplies for your army. God be praised! At last! At last! Now we may reclaim Orléans. 